Welcome, everyone, back to another episode of 41 is the Mic. I am Matt Derrick at Chiefs Digest, and alongside me for the saddest day of the year for my my dear, dear draft enthusiast, Nick Jacobs. The draft is over. He is now 362 days away from the next draft. Nick, I, I know this is like a three-day Christmas for you. Mm-hmm. You've, you've gotten to hold, wrap all, the, all these presents. What do you do between now and next year's draft? Um, I'm going to, you really want me to tell you? <laughs> oh, I, you're going to watch film on next year's guys already, aren't you? I was thinking about it. Um, <laughs> I was, uh, I wanted to get my bearings on what next year's going to look like, but no, I mean, I'll, I'll end up watching, uh, more in depth, the guys that they ended up getting just so I have a good feel for them by the time OTA start, when we get the opportunity to go out there and be able to ask them some different questions and what we did during draft weekend, um, but yeah, I'll do that. And then I'll start looking at kind of what next year looks like, um, for the, uh, potential draft eligible players and kind of just get a feel for them and where they're at. And then when they get to their season and kind of just kind of, I want to do a little bit better job of being more in tune with the draft before we get to combine. So you and I can potentially approach podcast a little bit differently in terms of getting some guests and adding more guests in the future um so but i need to know what they if they do or don't fit the chiefs and stuff like that so i gotta figure out how to uh, maneuver that but with the chiefs winning all the time and doing all the shows that i do you know i want to give everything i got to that because that's what i get paid for so um you know i'll try to find that uh the balancing act to a certain extent while also trying to um recharge on my two days off each week so and then, I, and then I got Michael Lombardi's book that I've been waiting specifically to start reading after the draft, and that's actually one of my number number one priorities. I was going to watch a movie last night because I didn't have any draft tape that I needed to to be able to watch or any of the coaches' film. I was like, hey, I'm you know, and I thought about watching the Chiefs prospects that they got, and I'm like, no, I'll do those on my off days. But I was like, I'm thinking about watching a movie for the first time in a minute that just isn't in the background as kind of noise while I'm watching prospects, but. I mean, this frankly, as honestly, as soon as you can start watching some film on 2025 Atlanta Falcons first round pick Brady Cook, um, the better off we're all going to be. Yeah. So. yeah, that's exactly what, <laughs> what's going to happen. You're going to have another quarterback on top of the quarterback. So you got you got to. I mean, why wouldn't you if you're the Falcons? Uh, well, let's get right into it. I mean, we talked a little bit about the first couple of picks on on the pods the Friday and Thursday and Friday, or Friday and Saturday, depending on what day you were awake and listening to them. Uh, <laughs> when we were recording them, <laughs> when we recorded them. So, uh, but let's let's start at the top. Uh, Chiefs moving up to get Xavier Worthy. They have definitely got their guy. Um, this. Uh, uh, going into the draft, this this he was a little bit further down on my list. I know, obviously, he was on your board as a, as a good fit for the Chiefs. I mean, I absolutely get it. I see it. And when you look at it on paper, I mean, this is a guy that certainly fit in for the Chiefs. He's he's what they they what Tyreek Hill. They're hoping that he was in 2018. That kind of thing. I mean, it's part of this offense. So. Nick, I mean, what's the the biggest things for you as far as worthy and and fitting in with the Chiefs' offense? Well, I mean, we talked about some of it the other night, but I'll uh, I want to reiterate it is just he gives them the opportunity to be really creative again. He's going to help Rishi Rice. He's going to help Travis Kelsey be able to really work over the middle. And depending if the Chiefs do anything else at wide receiver. It just gives them, and to use a phrase from Step Brothers, it gives them so much more room for activities. <laughs> They're, uh, you know, so like him and him and Brown allow them that opportunity, as long as they can stay healthy. Um, you know, because you never know with the NFL season, it can all come crumbling pretty quickly. But as long as those two guys can stay healthy, like defenses have to respect that level of speed again that they haven't had to for the past two years. The Chiefs can attack in a different way. You're going to have two safeties over top on a regular basis now, especially when Brown and um, and Worthy are out there on, on the field at the same time. Defenses are going to respect that. And then they're going to have – and if they don't respect it, they're going to get burned on a regular basis. And Mahomes is going to throw for four or 500 yards because <clears throat> the terrifying thing is that I don't know if the league understands right now is that 2018 offense the Chiefs had 
was Patrick's first full year <laughs> of experience. 2019, second full year of experience. So in that time that they ran the 2018 Chiefs offense, Patrick Mahomes has been to six AFC championships and won three Super Bowls. So what I'm getting at is that guy has seen everything the league can offer. Does that mean the league won't find something new and creative? No. And he'll add that to his, 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 uh, as I'm going to call it, his coverage uh, treasure chest <laughs> of memories. And he'll put that in there, and then he'll burn through that thing, and then they'll have to come up with something new and something again, something again, something again. And that's just going to be the back and forth that's going to be that career. So, like, the Chiefs, again, did this thing. They started a new evolution of what the offense can be, and they're reinventing themselves yet again to try to get to a three-peat. So... I'm just telling you what the Chiefs did draft wise this weekend. There's still a couple pieces left, and we'll talk about it at the end of the podcast about what they can kind of do. But I'm telling you from where they were before the draft and before the season, um, before the off season began to where they're at now, there's really not a lot else they're going to be able to do roster wise that, or that they need to do roster wise, unless there's an injury to really put themselves in good position to to crank it up another level. Yeah. And, you know, to me, barring any injuries, you know, the way that this room is stacked right now, I think you can certainly make the case. The Chiefs will probably be a little bit of a conversation they were last year as far as, you know, how many wide receivers are they going to take and keep during the season? Because obviously right now you would say, and hoping that your top three receivers are Hollywood Brown, Rasheed Rice, and Worthy. Um, Justin Watson's going to get plenty of looks and reps. I mean, he's the glue guy. So I still would probably say he's going to end up with third most snaps. I mean, if everybody's healthy, I think he would end up more work than worthy because worthy just needs a little bit more time to work in. He's going to need some more experience. He's going to be on special teams, so that will probably eat into his offensive workload. Unless Worthy comes in and simply forces his way onto the field and into the offense, you know, he'll probably end up in that kind of, you know, as far as workload goes, look at, you know, Tyreek Hill's workload as a rookie in 2016. I mean, it wasn't until 2017 that he really became a full-time starter and full-time player. So I could certainly see that transition for him. Remember, Rasheed Rice was forced into duty last year. That was not as much as the Chiefs planned on him playing last year, but he was forced to because nobody else could catch the ball and make plays. Um, this year, you're hoping that there's at least a couple of other players who can do that. Um, and Justin Watson is a complimentary receiver. He's a guy that they trust to always run the right routes and be in the right place and therefore, in theory, make things easier for other guys. But to your point, the speed also does that. So you get him and Hollywood on the field, that could open things up for Kelsey and Rice and other places. So, And then, you know, there's four right there. Sky Moore, Kadarius Tony, Justin Ross, Nico Remigio is going to be coming back. Um, that I think everybody was really impressed with last year and could obviously be a, you know, a, if, if, if Worthy only does maybe kick returns instead of punt returns or vice versa. Uh, he's more experienced as a punt returner, so maybe that's his role and you need a kick returner. Remigio is obviously could compete for that. We're way, way from training camp and, and who's going to be there and injuries can always play a part of it, but um, and not ruling out that, hey, the Chiefs might still be interested, whether it's undrafted free agents who are coming in, anybody else, but they're at least, you know, with the way that they've revamped this receiver room, Nick, you got to feel like they're in a better place than they were any point last season. Yeah, they're a little bit better. Um, I still would like to see one more addition. And that's that's just me personally. I'd like to see one more veteran addition to bring in there. And the reason I say that is because the way I'm looking at this right now, Worthy can learn from Brown, but is there somebody who can bring relief for Rice depending on what happens with his situation? That isn't, you know, and, and say – is that Justin Watson who has to fill into that role? Or is there somebody else that they need to attend, potentially bring in? Because whenever I'm looking at the wide receivers, the way I've got it in my mind, Brown and Worthy are going to be your top two at some point. But they're going to be on the field a lot more than, or half the time at minimum. Then Watson knows how to play every single position. That's a big part that people don't understand. And now that he has that speed there with him, he actually becomes a better complimentary piece having that level of speed with him to where he isn't having to be the quote unquote 
guy getting open and creating speed. He gets the one-on-one matchups, and he gets to work underneath if he wants to. Then, um, my uh, my opinion is, as long as he comes back healthy from that, Remigio is like the sneaky, sneaky good receiver that I was hoping mentally in my head could be the five or six for for the Chiefs and kind of be that Albert Wilson level of role because I saw a lot of Albert Wilson in his game before he got hurt and he showed a ton of promise. And like you said, he could be used on special teams. So in my mind right now, I I feel like you need to bring in one more veteran that can, whether that's a Tyler Boyd or somebody else who can come into this offense and help out after the uh, compensatory formula is over, whether it's him or somebody else, but bring in one more veteran who can learn the offense, be in the system, go down and, and run around some homes, do whatever you need to. And then that veteran is the one competing with Kadarius, Tony sky Moore, and any other receiver to really join that roster. And for, you know, and then you, I guess you can see what Justin Ross does, but I felt like last year they were really trying to give him the Jody Fortson role in the, in the scheme. And it just didn't seem to click or work for the most part, but you give him another opportunity this year to make it happen. And you just let things fall as they may, and it'll all work itself out in August, but you've got to give, you just, I just think there's one more final piece of that puzzle receiver wise, whether it was going to be a draft pick that they made or, and I was selfishly hoping to be like Javon Baker or Malik Washington to really push it over the top. And unfortunately, or even Brendan Rice, I I was hoping one of those three could be the one that they could kind of invest in and really kind of push it over the top to kind of work and help work and and fill in for Rice, depending on what happens with his situation. But I think that's the final piece of that puzzle in terms of the receiver room. Yeah, and... You know, you you kind of you bring that up and everything as far as you know worthy goes, and you know to me one of the things that really just is, stands out is, you know, it, it, and it's something that it, Brett Veach, Andy Reid, everybody who talked about him this weekend talks about was the stamina and the energy that this guy has, and that is one thing. No one in that r- receiver room is it sounds like going to outwork Xavier Worthy, and that was one thing that I think that the Chiefs probably miss more with Tyreek than anything else that Tyreek brought to the table because you can scheme around certain things that Tyreek can do and you can adapt the offense and Mahomes obviously can elevate receivers, but the one thing that was I think fans probably noticed and you know maybe it wasn't the the way that it got expressed, but the fact that they're I'm not saying the guys in that room didn't work hard, but Tyreek Hill was just tireless. I mean, he ran circles around everybody as far as how hard he worked. I mean, the stories go back to his first training camp when they're running gassers and Tyreek is just running in between guys and doing figure eights and still finishing before anybody else does. Um, that's the kind of thing that Worthy will do. I mean, Worthy is that same kind of energizer bunny. And when you've got a guy like that pushing you in a room, that can only be good for the rest of the room. So I don't, I think it goes beyond talent. I think, it, you know, this is one of those things where, you know, why did the Chiefs love Xavier Worthy so much? You know, the experience, three-year starter, a lot of experience, running the routes, being a complete receiver, all of those things matter. But the the character and the energy and the commitment and the loves football element of this guy, I mean, the, it checks all the boxes and then some. And I think that's why he's a Chief. Yeah, and that, and that's a phenomenal point. Is like just when you have somebody who pushes that room and pushes each one of them to where they feel like they got to get to that receiver's level. That's the key of any position group is having someone who's essentially they don't even realize it, but they're the unofficial leader of getting people to work harder. So when you have the level. And not only that, but maybe for other rooms to where when you have Patrick Mahomes and you don't want to disappoint Patrick Mahomes and see the level he's working at, and then you see Travis Kelsey working at the level he's working at, and then Chris Jones works at the level he does, and they're all in other rooms, but each one's seen each other doing that, that's how you're back-to-back champions. Those are are the people that kind of, the pillars that kind of help lead you to that. And more, the more you can add those type of people or the people that will follow along with that and push themselves as well for greatness, that's how you try to get to, to you know, to the three-peat. If you're, and I just, I feel like the Chiefs did a lot this weekend draft-wise to put themselves in the best position possible. There's still some little pieces here and there, 
but the little pieces I'm talking about here and there, in my opinion, are the ones that are more to help you weather the storm for injuries. If something, ha- uh, you know, looking at worst case scenario, and this is this upcoming month, in my opinion, is kind of like the last true month to really add to your roster of somebody who can impact and have enough time to learn the playbook and the scheme and have the comfortable amount of time to where if they get dropped in a game, they can execute without a problem and you're not having to pare down the playbook or stuff like you would come August, September, October range when people talk to us about trades and would you trade for this guy or this guy? And I'm like, hey, I get what you're saying, but that needed to really happen in May. Well, we're talking about Ward to being able to come in and push people in that receiver room. And um, pushing competition is probably the theme of the second round pick, too, with Kingsley yeah. Suamadia. Um, because this is the position battle for me to watch going into OTAs and probably extending into training camp. Um, it's Kingsley Suamadia and Wanye Morris are getting ready to go one on one. They're never going to face each other on a field again to snap, but this is the mano a mano. This is the gladiators battle of training camp. I mean, there are going to be some other battles, but these two are going to be fighting for starting left tackle and we'll see if the Chiefs ruin it for us by like going out and bring back in Donovan Smith too although I think that's less likely when you put a second round pick into the tackle position but Nick Kingsley Suamati is a uh, an impressive young man and from what we got to hear from his press conference the other night he's ready to come in and compete and knock some people around yeah the thing that stuck out uh, stuck out to me about Kingsley other than when I asked him about the blocking question and how excited he got talking about that uh, and bringing up Nick Bosa is I, I heard a guy who has the workman like mentality that he doesn't want to be outward, that he's going to explore everything possible to fully use his physical ability and to honor his family's name. And I think that meant a lot to him, the way he talked about his family, the way he talked about his cousin Panay and how much Panay's helped him and just how much work he's put in. And then I I think Panay is going to work really hard with him, train really hard with him. And I think he's going to teach him everything that he can so that his family members can be, his family member can be just as good or try to be, or reach his full ceiling. Even if it's not just as good to be at the level he's capable of. And just, just the way he talked and the way he approached things. I just, I saw a guy that even if he's not up to par, in OTAs to where he needs to be the, be the starting left tackle, or even if he's not up to this level or that level, he's a guy I'm never going to question his work ethic. I can already tell that from talking to him, the way he talks and how he person. You can tell if you talk to enough athletes over time, like who has that drive, who has that level, and then who is just there for for the riches and spoils of what the of what the life brings to you being an athlete. But that's. Kingsley's a guy that's he's going to give this organization, this fan base, everything that he's got. And like I said, it, you can be critical about what he may or may not be to a certain extent, but you'll never have to question that he's putting in the work to get better. Yeah. I mean, are there things that he can clean up? Absolutely. The Chiefs are talking about that. I've already, you know, and so, but, you know, Wanya Morris has the same thing. I mean, there's some improvements that he needs to make. One thing that the Chiefs absolutely wanted to have, though, was competition because they felt like that that Wanya needs someone to compete against, someone to fight against. And and Kingsley's the same way. I mean, the fact that these two guys are going against each other can only make them both better. I mean, because they're going to have to fight that way. But I think you make a, another really interesting point, which is that uh, Kingsley seems like the, absolutely the kind of guy that there's there's two things that are true. One, even though he ended up with exactly the team that he was hoping for and the team that he thought was going to draft him and, you know, gets to play for Andy Reid, a BYU legend. I mean, these are all dreams come true for Kingsley Suamati. I mean, he had his, his grandma made red and gold lays for his draft party because they he, they thought he was going to get to the Chiefs. So dreams come true. But like you said, it's not just his family that he wants to prove and to live up to and, and everything. 
he feels and you can you can hear it in, in, in his words and his his emotions that he doesn't want to embarrass Andy Reid. He doesn't want to embarrass Patrick Mahomes. He feels, you know, the need to live up to what the expectations are and exceed them because he feels the pressure to do that. But I tell you what, I also heard a guy with a chip on his shoulder because, mm-hmm. you know, there was a lot of people who thought he was a borderline into the first round pick. He waited a long time. And he brought that up immediately, that there was a lot of emotions, a lot of crying. Um, he'd been told about the waiting period. And now, you know, when you're when you're getting drafted and having to wait, and he finally understood that Thursday, Friday, Thursday and Friday and having to wait as long as he did, because he went much later than he expected to. And a lot of people expected him to. And you can see different, you know, some people get ticked off about that and, and, so, and they can't get out of it. Kingsley, I think, had both sides of it. I mean, he was obviously very happy to end up where he was, but you could also hear that he's like, hey, wait a minute, I need to prove that I wasn't the 63rd best player in this draft. I mean, I've, I need to go around and knock some people around. Yeah, and he'll, uh, I like that. I like the competition they've created between him and Wanya. Like, I, I, that's what you want to see. And the best person is the best person's going to win. The most driven person's going to win. And the fun part of that is winner has to protect uh, the franchise's <laughs> blind side. No pressure. Um, <laughs> They have they have the most pressure cooker position. They're going to be asked about it relentlessly from now until the first game of the season. And like, I just don't know if there's I don't know if there's two I don't know if there's two players under more pressure than those two guys are going to be. But you're gonna you're gonna find no matter who wins, you're gonna find the the best left tackle on this roster because they're gonna have to bring that out in one another. Yeah, and you know what. Right now, I'd say that you're in a position, even though these guys are going to be young, this might be the best situated that Chiefs tackle group has been in a while. Because Mm -hmm. even with the loser of that group being your swing tackle, I think you're going to be in a lot better position than maybe the Chiefs abandoned years past that that tackle spot a little bit deeper. So we'll see how that room settles out. Obviously, injuries, those things can can matter. But um, this and this is an ascending group. I mean, the, these last two picks have been as much about 2025 and 2026. I mean, could this be your 2026 offensive line with Kingsley Suamati on one side and Wanya Morris on the other? Yeah, it absolutely could. So the Chiefs are looking forward to that. Um, first 63 picks, the Chiefs at least had two draft picks. Nick, we had to wait 68 more selections before the Chiefs were back on the board um, after you know trading out of the third round. But we got two quick ones in a hurry. Let's start with fourth round, number 131 overall. Um, a little earlier than I thought they might have draft might address this spot if they addressed it at all. But tight end Jared Wiley from TCU coming in, um, bigger than the Chiefs have gone in the past, bigger than Noah Gray. Um, he is more Travis Kelsey size, but let's let's lower the expectations. He's not as athletic as Travis Kelsey. Yeah, so I mean, I I personally didn't think they're going to address tight end at all. I'd kind of given up on that hope through the pre-draft. Uh, press conference i was like all right fred didn't have that on the list i was like uh as much as i'd love to see it i don't know i don't know what's gonna happen especially when bowers was gone and didn't drop down i was like i don't boy i really don't know if they're gonna do it um but then they surprised us and got jared wiley hey he was on the board talented uh talented res- tight end he's he's a good res- I like to call him receiver. He catches the ball cleanly, catches it away from his body, does the right things when he's, you know, from a receiver mentality in that regard. He's a solid blocker and like he's got deceptive speed for his size. When you see his size, you're like, oh, that's good. He's going to be lumbering. And then you watch him catch and you're like, nope, he's not. He's doing all right. Yep. He's doing pretty good right there. Got up to top end speed. There we are. Um, And like, but I'm saying where he's going to be dangerous early on is on crossing routes. And whenever the Chiefs clear stuff out over the middle, the the way he's going to be able to work and do, and I think the reason they got him is to help Travis not take as many hits over the middle and have to work as much over the middle and to be able to kind of be that buffer to take some of the snaps for Travis, then take some of those hits for Travis, but also be able to be a blocker. So Travis doesn't necessarily have to block and have the wear and tear of that as well. So I think this was I think this was the help Travis type of pick 
and I'm all for that. So not only did you help Travis by bringing in Worthy, you bring in Wiley, who can kind of help alleviate some of that. And then on top of that, you've got Noah Gray, who's still working his way through what he's going to be. And then you have Herb Smith, who brings speed to this scheme. So from a wide, uh, from a tight end room, compared uh, comparing with the wide receiver room, they're in a good skill set position to where they've added speed and they've added the opportunity to limit reps that wear and tear Kelsey down at this point in his career. Yeah, and the I mean, there's a couple of things about Wiley that stand out, and one certainly is that they're adding size to that room. You know, a new allude to, to Noah Gray. I mean, he is Noah's Noah's one of the smaller tight ends around. I mean, he's more in, in that Evan Ingram, Trey Burton kind of category that the Chiefs have been trying to develop and find. But Wiley, six six two forty nine. I mean, he is a big guy, and you know, as a result, size. People look at him and say, hey, blocker, and probably, certainly, I mean, he can bring that element to this team, but Jason Lamb, the area scout who scouted him in college, you know, mentioned the fact that he's a much underrated, you know, pass catcher as a result of that, and he is late to the position. I mean, a little bit like Travis Kelsey in that sense, he was a high school quarterback, like Travis, uh, converted the tight end in college, you know, had an adjustment, started at Texas, really never got on the field much at Texas, Mm -hmm. and then gets the TCU. Really, you look at his playing time. I mean, he's only got, you could really say, maybe two and a half years of experience at at tight end just because of how little he played at Texas. Um, Older player, but sure, you can see that as a result of, one, his past experience, that he's got that well-rounded aspect. Obviously, Travis has talked about the advantages of playing high school quarterback and how that can translate to helping you at tight end. Um, but the fact that, you know, his his best football should still be ahead of him. Um, he's probably a little bit deceptively athletic, even though he's not as athletic as Travis. But, you know, in his bio, he played baseball, too. So, you know, obviously there's a little bit more there. But what Travis can teach him will be the biggest thing. And if there's things that he can learn when watching Travis and picking up skills, he's, I, you alluded to it. I mean, he's never going to be as fast or as talented as Travis Kelsey. Nobody is. But can he pick up some things to add with what he's already got? Seems like a player who can, because he's, he's once again, I mean, like those, those Chiefs guys. I mean, he's a captain. He seems like a smart kid. Um, seems like there's an opportunity there. But to me, the size is the biggest thing. Yeah, I don't disagree with you, Matt. Um, Chiefs then went very, very quickly, only two more picks before they got to their next draft pick. And this, this, the next, the, the, the second fourth round pick is an interesting one to me. I mean, cause this is one that, um, I was stunned that he was still there uh, mm-hmm. because Jaden Hicks as a safety was number one. I know on Dane Brugler's board, I think he was number one on your board too, right? Nick, uh, he was two, number two, he was up there. Yeah, I mean, he was the top safety or top two safety on a lot of boards. And, you know, so to me, being there in the fourth round, I thought the Chiefs would go safety at some point in this this draft, Nick. But I thought that the top safeties were going to go off, you know, earlier before the Chiefs could really address it. So I thought if they did, maybe it would be sixth and seventh round. Fourth round getting Jaden Hicks might be the best value of any pick that they got. Yeah, it, it was it was tremendous value for what they were able to do. Um the thing I'll say with Hicks is like I asked him in the Zoom when we got to talk to him, he's an enforcer. Like he's gonna go out there, he's gonna lay some people out. He wants to dislodge the ball from them in a correct way that isn't targeting. Um, so he's got that down. And like he wants to set a message over the middle that middle's closed. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's closed for business. And like he wants to let people know that that's the case. But he's versatile enough to where he can cover a tight end. And he can do it effectively. He doesn't have to grab, doesn't have to hold. He's got that athletic ability to do it. He's got the physicality mentality-wise to do it. Then he can also help and run support. He can be a box safety if they need him to be. And then he can also be one of the two safeties up top and has the range to cut, cut half the field away. So, I mean, they can use him in three different ways, three different levels. And in Steve Spagnuolo's scheme, the ability to do all that's fantastic, and that's what you want. And then that allows the versatility to where – hey, if they want to have Chamari rotate down and take on a receiver, they can, and he can take on the slot position if he needs to. And then, you know, Jaden stays back up there 
and helps with either Brian Cook or helps with Justin Reed or whatever they end up wanting to do in that. And for me personally, whenever they drafted him, I'm like, okay, this is the heir apparent to Justin Reed. This is the one that Justin Reed mentors and teaches him the way. And if Justin doesn't get a new contract here, it would be because Hicks would be the guy who would take on that role long term. You don't want that to be the case because Justin Reed's a phenomenal team guy. He works well in the locker room, talented football player, and is bigger in that defense than people realize in terms of what he does. So, but you do need a backup plan in case things don't go well. And Hicks, I think, is what provides in that spot. Yeah, a- absolutely. And that's that's what I mean, I think you really like about this pick is that and that was why I felt like the Chiefs had to address safety in this draft because you don't have Justin Reed under contract for 2025. And in addition to that, you need a, a, another safety even for this year. I mean, for just depth purposes. Um you've got Brian Cook coming back from the injury while all indications are he should be 100% before training camp and you're hoping he'll be back this is not doesn't sound like it's the kind of injury that should you know, affect him a lot in the year coming back, but you'd never know with those kind of things. But having insurance for Justin Reed going forward and having insurance for 2024 when you're trying to three-peat, that to me makes this just an absolutely incredible pick. Um, I tried to find out, you know, why, you know, was the reason why he was going down. And the only negative thing I could find anywhere was, you know, Dane Brugler noting in his, his assessment that, you know, one NFL scout told him there's a concern that he might grow out of the safety spot because he's 21 he's already almost 6'2 he's 215 and you know and I asked uh, uh, I think I'm trying to remember if that was I think it was uh, correct me if I'm wrong was that Greg Castillo that that scouted him Nick I think it was maybe Um, um, I'm trying to remember now but um, he I, I asked about that and you know he said that wasn't a concern for the Chiefs at all I mean if anything if he gets a little bigger I mean they're going to be okay with that but um, he's already a little bit bigger than um, than Justin Reed is but if he does get a little bit taller a little bit bit more weight I mean I, they, they feel like that they can manage that but honestly that just makes him a bigger thumper over the middle and right now they feel comfortable that he's a guy who can play every single safety position he can play in the box he can play in the slot he can guard to tie it in he can play on the back end and so that's exactly what the chiefs want and you know you could could you see a, a day where he's on one side brian cook's on the other and you've still got chamari connor who can play inside yeah i mean that to me if it works out would be a really tough rotation and if you are able to keep justin reed around I mean, that just makes that group even tougher down the road. So I I see no downside to this. When you're able to get what a lot of people thought was one of the two best safeties in this draft in the fourth round, that's a home run selection in my book. Yeah, I think the Chiefs got some sneaky good value there in the fourth round. And I and part of it is, like you and I talked about before we came on here, I think they sacrificed running back to get that. With Jared, you know, with with this value that they got from Wiley and that, because there was a run on running backs there, and the 49ers deliberately traded up in front of the Chiefs to get a running back that I think was on there was on my board, and I knew had the speed that I knew the Chiefs would covet, and the 49ers snuck up and took Isaac from I believe Louisville, and so once they got Isaac, I was like, um, all right, I mean. They'll either reach for a running back here or they'll just take value. And then you see Jared Wiley pop on the board. It's like, and they took value. All right. Um, and then, you know, then you saw the next pick. You're like, all right, let's see. Is it going to be running back? Going to be interior? What's it going to be? And then, boom, it's safety. And you're like, all right, another one off their checklist. And I was like, and a f- great value in that spot because that dude should have been going in the second round before the Chiefs left tackle, and he didn't. So I was like, snuck up and got that one. And, you know, we're, we're, I, I love it when transitions work out great for me, Nick, because we're talking about the versatility <laughs> that, that uh, Hicks has. And when the Chiefs needed to address interior offensive line, I feel really, really stupid in retrospect, Nick, because 
And one, you know, fact, you know, it was like, okay, are the, the Chiefs need to re- essentially replace Nick Allegretti. They need somebody who can come in and play all three interior positions and also be ready to start next year if they're not able to keep both Creed Humphrey and Trey Smith. And then considering, you know, we've been talking about Joe Tooney's status and that $26.9 million cap hit for next year at 33 years old. Uh, all those reasons, you needed somebody that could potentially play guard and or center. And it's like, hey, wait a minute, let's look at the best guards and who can play center and who can play center, you know, but who plays center, but it could also play guard. Um, she's going to fifth round and get a guy to play that started at both. <laughs> so maybe in retrospect, Hunter Norzad should have been absolutely the pick for the Chiefs that we were all talking about all along because um, this guy started at four different positions in college. He started at all three interior line positions. And when you're talking about replacing Nick Allegretti, Nick, I mean, this, he, Hunter Norzad, I mean, another Big Ten guy kind of looks like a photocopy. Yeah, no. The second they the second they got him, if you look on, uh, if you go back through the timeline of my uh, Twitter account, you will see that I used the Jersey Shore fist pumping uh, GIF or GIF, however you call it. Um, I do it for both because people people hear it both ways. <laughs> so I want people to be able to translate it properly on that one. Um, but like when they got him, I'm like, all right, there it is. There's that interior offensive lineman, one that I I was a huge fan of because I, I loved him. And I love the guy from Wisconsin who ended up going earlier there in the fourth round. And like either one, they just, they're that throwback old school mentality, bury you, lock on to you, bury in the dirt, be able to properly anchor, be able to re anchor if somebody gets leverage on them. And Hunter has that. And Hunter's got that to a T. He may get pushed back one or two steps in some of the Big Ten games I saw, but guess what? He re anchored and he ended that party. And he said, Well, it was fun while it lasted. There's the door if you want to go. Um <laughs> in a physical way. <laughs> um, but you know, whenever we talked to him on the presser and then I uh, asked him about uh playing in the Big Ten and kind of what he wanted to show mentality wise, and he says, I don't want people to know I'm gonna punch him in the face. <laughs> and I was like, and that's an offensive lineman. And then just the smile he had like I had a smile and then he smiled back because he saw it. And uh like that's the mentality you want an offensive lineman. And he had, you know, and he has that. And so like and you you know that dude's gonna work hard. Like I mean he just had that mentality from talking to him just no nonsense. Here's what needs to be done. This is what's gonna be done. Because that's to be an offensive to be an offensive lineman in in whatever form, that's the mentality a lot of offensive linemen have. They they do they do thankless work, they take pride in it. They take pride in protecting others. And then above all else, they are willing to do the dirty work and they do not care that they're doing the dirty work because that was entrusted in them. And they know that's, what's going to help them around people around them succeed. So like when you're looking for somebody in a, in a business industry, (laughs) if you find out they're a former offensive lineman, you already know a lot of the characteristics and principles they're going to have to work in your industry. They're not going to be prima donna wide receivers. Um, (laughs) but they, they will, uh, they are, they are the workman's type and Hunter, Hunter has that, and above all else, just like the way he kind of, the way he lit up talking about his favorite block and what he likes to do, like those, those spoke volumes. Yeah, and uh, all these guys like, you know, I guess it should not, you know, surprise you. I mean, these guys all like zone blocking, Nick, and um, absolutely love blowing up three techs, so Mm -hmm. all these guys want to seem to just go out there and absolutely just blow some people up. On the football field, yes. <laughs> On the football um, field. Yes. <laughs> Um, uh, a lot of things stand out about Hunter. I mean, one, the dude is ridiculously smart. Um, has a mechanical engineering degree from Cornell. I so, love when you asked him the question about it and his reaction to it. He's like, tell him the, for people that didn't, I want you to give the reaction. Yeah, I mean, he, well, he he pursued, pursued a you know postgraduate degree. I mean, he's working on that at Penn State, and um, scout who scouted him said that actually there was some competition for him uh, because he was just as valuable to some engineering departments as he was to the football team. So when, when he was in the portal, I mean, there was a, apparently a bunch of schools that wanted him, and some engineering departments were like pushing their football team, go get this guy. Um, so yeah, I asked him. I mean, it was going to be like a Laurent Dubernay Tardif, if you know, when you know, because it was was McCain mechanical engineering just to fall back or do you want to keep working on that and he's like yeah i'm done with school i'm not <laughs> i'm not doing that 
<laughs> and I know, I know he also in one of the interviews, you know, would ask about his, ask about his hobby. I think he said his only hobbies were Legos. So, um, this dude's a football player, Nick. There's no doubt about that. Um, he absolutely is. And having the background he does, where you talk about either Legos or you talk about mechanical engineering, you've got to have a tactician mind for that. You have to have a chess match mind for that type of stuff. So when you hear those type of things, that means that that person has a creative mind that is always thinking of a bigger picture. And guess what you need in your center? Somebody that can see things coming from a mile away, evaluate, analyze, and have it all worked out in their head before it even happens. And you got a mechanical engineering degree. Got a feeling you get that all pretty much worked out. So he gives the Chiefs a very good, young, strong, reliable backup behind Creed Humphrey. But he also gives them somebody that has the ability to play left and right guard. And you'll see, I guarantee we'll see that up at training camp. We'll see that at mini camp. We'll see that at OTAs. They're going to move him around and let him get experience and get work at each spot and work with him on coaches film about it. So I don't think he's going to have just one position, one home, but I do think that he is going to be their Allegretti now. And above all else, man, he's going to be a very physical football player. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see who kind of ends up as the the sixth man, you know, is that one guy that they bring in for jumbo packages. Um, they'll have some options. I mean, maybe that is no Zed, but there's that, no doubt. I mean, you know, obviously for this year, for 24, you're hoping that he is the first guy in if you have an injury on the interior. And for the first time, I mean, the Chiefs are going to have an experienced college center. I mean, Allegretti played a little bit at center in college, but, you know, he was uh, did not play much of it in the NFL, even in a game until this year. So mm-hmm. um, he's Norza has a much more experience at all three of those spots than the Chiefs have had in the backup in, in quite a few years. Um, going into the sixth round, I, I say Hunter Norzad was a, as kind of a photocopy of Nick Allegretti from a versatility standpoint. I will say this also. He's also a photocopy of uh, Andrew Wiley if you put a mullet and a little bit more hair on him. So um, should be familiar to Chiefs fans, and especially that mustache. I think it, it definitely gives you some Andrew Wiley vibes. Um, but another carbon copy to me, and I don't want to put too much pressure on this kid because, I mean, hey, 40 times are 40 times, and that's the one area where they're not the same. But if you look at height, you look at weight, you look at 10-yard split, you look at broad jump, I mean, a lot of things, there's there's a lot of similarities between Kamal Hayden and, and Legereus Sneed, and I'm not comparing the two in that sense. I'm just saying Kamal Hayden from Tennessee in the sixth round at 211 overall is a, a prototypical Chiefs corner. There were three guys that were going to be on day three board that I was really hoping the Chiefs could get one of them. Um, The first one I had was Kyrie Jackson from Oregon. Just just a guy 6'4". And how athletic he was, I was like, man, if they can get him, that that was going to be, I was like, that was going to be, that was going to be fun for the Chiefs to have a 6'4 corner that has that type of athletic ability to work with. Um, Then the next one was uh, Dwight McLaughlin from Arkansas. Dude's a ball hawk playmaker, and I, you know, and I was hoping that maybe the Chiefs could be able to get him if he was on the board, and I think he was off at the time. Then the last one I had was Kamal Hayden from Tennessee, and I really liked all three of those guys because they all brought size, they all brought athletic ability, but Kamal brings probably, of those three, he may bring the best athletic ability of the three, and the guy's vertical. One, I, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say this. There was one play I was watching of his coach's phone when he made an interception, a high point of the football. And I'm like, does he have an invisible step ladder? I don't see right now because he should not be jumping this high. And he is. Um, so, but like he just, yeah, he had from a tackling perspective, he may not be up to the chief's par and what they like in a, in, in a tackler. But as, as I had one uh, former player that I know remind me, he says, what corner do you know that likes to tackle? <laughs> he's like, he's like, if they if they could There's tackle, only like play. maybe one or two I know of. And he's like, if they could tackle, they'd have to play safety. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm like touche. Um, so, but like, it's yeah, it. He's Kamal, and then when and when you know when we chatted with him on the presser, and I just like the answer that he gave whenever I was asking him, hey. You had to wait till the sixth round to get picked. I know you were pretty bummed about it. And then, you know, he showed KJ Osborne, you know, there with him, uh, kind of coaching him through it and everything. And I was like, you had to, you had to wait this long, but what does it mean to you 
that you had the two time back to back Super Bowl champions believing in you and your game to take a pick on you and to bring you into that organization. And then like, you know, it, you could tell he's appreciative, but he also, he's got a humble family around him that by the, the responses he had that like, Hey, you got your chance, just go work. And like just the way that they kind of approached it with them. I just, you know, I'm sure it's a big moment for the family, but on top of it, he seemed very level headed. And there's some guys you and I have heard from over the years that you're like, oh boy, <laughs> don't don't uh, don't know how that's gonna work uh, infusing that locker room, but yeah, Kamal like he's he had a level headedness about him, very humbleness about him, but also had like you said enough of a chip on his shoulder that he wants to go out and prove that he wasn't at the six round level that he's a much better corner than what some teams may have gauged him at, so. I uh, another pick that like you know uh, look it is like with any draft pick if they're if they're on the board that I had I saw something in them that's promising that I think the Chiefs coaching staff can develop so like I'm not upset with any of these picks because six out of seven of them were on my board and they all but when you get to take that next piece that you and I did to where we get to talk to them in a Zoom and learn their personality, even though the Chiefs have already done all this, that was our first introduction to essentially sell a lot of media members about who they are as a player, how they're going to fit in that locker room, even though they've already done all their Zooms, they've, they've talked to coaches, they've done that. So that's where kind of for us, that's like I say, whenever Matt and I do these evaluations in previous podcasts, this is the final element that we get after the selection to find out who they are and what drives them. And then that's where it all comes together. That's kind of the final puzzle piece for us to be able to see, is this the good fit? Is this something they're going to have to work on? Is this a person that is going to be the knucklehead of the locker room that they're going to have to kind of police a little bit? And every single guy you could tell is going to fit into this locker room. But then also the fact that the Chiefs are – having the success they are as an organization, each one of them realizes that they're going to have to, you heard each one say it, that they realize they're going to have to step up their game because they're playing with Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, Chris Jones. And each one of them mentioned either one of those guys or all three of those guys at various points. And also Andy Reid. So like the, the level of respect those guys command in the football community at college, either, you know, college level, high school level, at pro level, like it just, I'm just saying that there's just a certain element about this organization right now that I think every Chiefs fan should be able to appreciate that there's guys that are excited to come here because of who they get to play with. That is an absolutely fantastic point because you're right about all of these players. And, um, you know, and I get sometimes you, you know, sometimes fans say, hey, sometimes we want maybe a guy with some badge and we don't care if they're, you know, have a, you know, an, an edgy attitude. Well, I'll tell you who does mm-hmm. care. Everybody that they play with has to share a locker room with them. Mm-hmm. Um, you want a guy, honestly, that can flip that switch, who can be on the field but is an A-plus teammate in the locker room. And if you can't do that, you're not going to win three Super Bowls in a row. So, you know what? There's there's some players that I know that Chiefs fans are disappointed that haven't been drafted by this team before. Well, I'll tell you what. Chiefs wouldn't be going for three and three Super Bowls in a row if they had some of those team players on this team. Mm-hmm. So, and Hayden's absolutely seems like one of those guys. And here's the ridiculous thing about him. And also, I guess the one caveat about him, you know, Looking at his production in college, 18 passes broken up and six interceptions. He did that in 23 games. He is a ball hawk in right. the truest sense of the word. I mean, he absolutely has a nose for the football. The problem is in three seasons at Tennessee, played 23 games. I mean, he had you know injuries each season. Uh, it was a shoulder injury last October. He had to have surgery on. Um, that kept him from testing at the combine. He just went through measurements. He didn't get back onto the field to do you know testing until his pro day. And like I said, his pro day. I mean, other than his 40 time, and he didn't test in the bench press because of that shoulder. Um, he, I mean, I don't know if he was fully 100 percent strength yet. So his numbers were good in a lot of. Areas. The 40 speed was the only one that concerned people. Is that because he was just getting back onto the field and, and working? And, you know, could that, hey, if his pro day had been a month later, would that have been a 4.5 or a 4.45 instead of a 4.57? I don't know. Um, we'll find out what kind of speed he can play with. But yeah. um, he's a true ball hawk. And I, one thing, uh, my last note on him is that um, I know that Dane Brugler's scouting report is that he's a prototypical cover two corner. 
that was also the same thing that people said about Legereus Sneed coming right. out. So that, well, once again, I think it's not my comparison to Legereus Sneed. It's my, this dude is exactly what the Chiefs look for in a corner. And if Dave Merritt and Steve Spagnolo can get out of him what they've gotten out of the others, they're going to get a really good player. Um, we've got one more to go, Nick. And I should, I want to know that of the six guys we've talked about, all six were on your draft board as players that the Chiefs should be interested in. So, and most of them ended up in the round that I thought they were going to. So, I'm happy yes, about that. They Means I'm doing did. something right with my life, Matt. Okay. You, you are doing. And I'm, and I'm, I'm genuinely telling this to people. I, I'm not kidding when I say this, man, because like you know how much work I put into in the time I was going to sleep and waking up and, and doing this with my free time. Um, not on work company time. I don't like to, I don't like to charge the company for that. I I let them reap the benefits of it, but I don't (laughs) like try to charge them for it because it's my own personal interest. They're not asking me to, to do all that. Um, but like, you know, for people to understand, I'm going to bed at like four or five in the morning and waking up at 10, maybe 11 to go to work (laughs) for the day. And, do that and then come home, you know, reset for an hour and then start going through coach's phone probably 10 o'clock at night till five in the morning, typically. And I've been doing that from, well, since my grandpa's funeral after the weekend, my grandpa's funeral until, until now. So that's why I want to space it out a little bit more next year in case some unforeseen situations (laughs) arise uh, to give myself a little bit more runway to where I don't have to do it at that intensity or that level. But it, to make sure that it hits that much to be six to seven, like that lets me know that I'm not wasting my time that I didn't do that. But you know what I'm saying? Like you feel like some years if you go two or six, like I did Dorsey's 2017 year and like the people, the people that heckled me about that, about that 2017 year when I went to a six and and then 2018, whenever, you know, it's 50%, but like people like, why isn't Nani on your board? Why isn't this person on your board? Um, and then the people that heckled me about McColl Hardman not even being on my board. And I'm like, look, I think it's with McColl. I was like, I think it's going to take four years before he's even comfortable at receiver. And I was like, you don't invest as, you know, I'm not investing a pick unless it'd be like a sixth or seventh at best for that to potentially, you know, not work out and fizzle out. So like the thing I want to say to people, and this is, this is how I break it down. Um, First round, if 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 I personally put a first round number on them, I think they are going to be a starter for all four years, or they're going to be a high contributor that plays 800 to 1,000 snaps. If I put a second round grade on them, they have some errors in their game, or they have some things that they have to work on, but if they get to the right situation, they will become a starter. Third round, they may not be the best athlete in the world, but I think they're going to contribute at minimum on special teams, be a backup, and be able to help out. Fourth round is kind of, they have an injury concern for the most part, but their talent is noticeable. They have the skill set they need, and they could become a star in the league. Fifth round, sixth round, seventh round is just you're taking chances at that point, and you're just purely basing it off how much closer are they ready to NFL ready. So whenever I put those rounds on them, that is uh, that is based on what I think they can they be. So like you take Kamal, for example. I had a six run grade on him, but I did because I knew he was better than a priority free agent athletically. And he had enough promise that he could potentially be something, but there's enough holes in the game right now that he needs coaching from. But if he gets to somebody like Dave Merritt, who can coach as we've emphasized on this podcast, many a times who can coach at the level Dave Merritt does, then he could become maybe a star like Snead, maybe, or maybe somebody different. And then you're talking down the road about, hey, the Chiefs may have to have, you know, the, the look what the Chiefs did with Kamal and, you know, teams screwed up by passing on him. And you're kind of hoping you can repeat history in that regard. So, yeah, just to know that I didn't waste my time and that it, that didn't happen, like that's kind of, that's why that's a big deal to me that, 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 I, you know, I'm bummed it wasn't a seven for seven, though. I'm not going to lie, Matt. I was really hoping. I was hoping among hoping, and then it happened. I'm like, oh, the perfect game's over. <laughs> well, two things I have to note here. One is that uh, John Dorsey should have only had two of six guys on his board in 2017. Um, would have been better off if you taken four different players, probably four guys off your board. But that's neither here nor there. But <laughs> secondly, the Chiefs had to go and get a school that hasn't had a player selected in the NFL draft in 35 years in order to to stump the Schwab on this one, Nick. 
Uh, CJ Hansen, Holy Cross, Holy Cross gets their first player in the NFL since 1989, and that team that drafted a player was the Chiefs too. So the Chiefs apparently have Holy Cross dominated in the NFL. They do, yeah, because I remember Murray coming out of there because I had him on my board that one year. And, yeah, C.J. Hansen, he uh, he wrecked it for me. So, you know, <laughs> I'm just kidding. He didn't well, now, do anything, and I loved his presser. Like he's Now you need C.J. Hansen to come in and wreck some things on the offensive line. Yeah, well, I just I, – I'll say with him, like, I, I really love listening to his press conference. I didn't have time to ask a question because uh, we had a bunch of tornado warnings that we were dealing with on air, and I'm just trying to get enough done in case I still – because I didn't know if I was going to have my show at 6.30 to 7.00. And for people that don't know uh, what I'm doing, so for example, if you watch our Chiefs special at any point this past couple of days, I'm the editor for it. So I'm editing all uh, about 90, if not 100% of the video you're going to see on air. And that'll be the same with Sunday Sound Off that Matt's going to be on uh, later tonight if you're hearing this podcast before we do Sunday Sound Off. And then I'll build the graphics for it. Then I'll help write script or I'll write the script. And then I ask the our phenomenal sports department. Hey, look over it. See if you're comfortable with it. See if it fits your personality. I was like, don't read it like I would because I'm incompetent in coherent sentences. And I want you to look much better on air than I can type. So, (laughs) um, so, but I mean, with that, that was, that was a full 20 minute show that we were potentially going to do if there wasn't another tornado warning that was going to happen. And so, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm doing some interviews. Like I'm joining you guys on the interviews from uh, from the office there while I'm editing and building the building the shows and building the rundown and writing in the script and building the graphics and doing all that. So I mean, I'm doing you know handful of different things all at the same time, and like I just I, I still got to his interview when I got to hear it though. I'm like, dude, like there's some questions I want to ask him. I'll ask him down the road. But I was like. This guy is so thankful that the Chiefs took a chance on him. And then you listen to his call with Andy Reid, just how much it meant to him that the Chiefs believed in him. Like, I'm telling you, like, the C.J. Hansen, like, we'll see what happens with him down the road. And I did watch some of his coaches' film. I just didn't have enough to feel comfortable to have a full analysis on him. And I don't like to just do it based on one game. I can only find one game of his. But I'm I'm going to be rooting for him just simply because – like hearing that presser, like just just how awestruck he is that the Super Bowl champions took a chance on a guy from Holy Cross and that he's in the NFL. Like you're hoping you're hoping Andy Heck and them can get him turned into a guy that whether he plays center guard, whatever. I it's he's another one of those guys that I that I know is gonna give everything he's got. Yeah, uh, there's no doubt. I mean, the Chiefs drafted a lot of those guys that you can absolutely see why they're going to fit into this locker room. You can absolutely see why the Chiefs believe that they are players who can make this team in 2024 and try to contribute towards that three-peat. I mean, there is absolutely no doubt. I mean, that is... that's on this team's mind. I mean, they're not, they were not drafting anybody uh, this year that they feel like is a true developmental prospect or anything of that nature. I mean, they were drafting for needs. They were hammering away on them. Um, Hanson's a great example of that. I mean, do they, how much depth do they need on the interior? Well, quite a bit. I mean, really at this point, um, outside of your three starters, you've got Mike Caliendo coming back, but you've lost Nick Allegretti. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you know, there is a little bit of peaking ahead towards 2025 because we've talked about the contract issues and everything that you've got, you're probably going to need at least two, you know, younger guys on that 2025 team, whether one's a starter or one's a backup. So, you know, the the Chiefs hammered away at that spot. Hanson is a little bit more of a developmental project just because of his background, college, and every experience. This is going to be a big jump in level for him. Mm -hmm. But talk about a guy with all the tools, um, the size, everything. He did not play with Jimmy Murray. They were, you know, his first year, I think, at Holy cross was uh murray's rookie year with the chiefs so they did not cross over but they know each other and um hansen said he got texted by jimmy murray this week so you know and her, had heard from him during the draft um that's pretty cool connection because not a lot of uh holy cross players in the nfl and the fact that you know a former guy that had been spent some time with the chiefs was encouraging hansen and he ends up in kansas city is a, i think a really cool connection um this class in general nick you know, what's, what's, I, I, I mean, obviously we haven't had a whole lot of criticism about any of these guys. No, they're all going to be what I take away from hearing them. And from coaches film is 
they all have a ton of upside that needs to be coached up. They all have ability that needs to be coached up and refined, and they're going to get that chance professionally. And I think above all else, they are going to fit into the locker room. I think they're all going to be able to come into the locker room. I think they're all going to see the way the Chiefs work, the way the Chiefs go about stuff. And if they need to raise their level from where they previously were, they're going to. And so I think each one of them is coming into a phenomenal situation for the start of their NFL careers to get the max earning of what they can in this league. So, yeah, I'm I'm not going to be – I don't have anything I'm upset about on that front. Um, if you do want to talk about what I think they should – we should be on the lookout in terms of – Hopefully what they add, I'm all for it. But no, I don't I don't have any I don't have any knocks on this draft class. I'm just curious to see how it all shakes out when August rolls around. Yeah. I mean, I'm not as I get older, Nick, and getting into this, I'm and covering the team every year more and more. I'm not big on immediate grades. So I've got no interest in saying this was a A minus or a B plus or a C because the reality of it is is that we don't know. Right. It's just pure guessing because um, you don't know how these guys are going to fit in. Um, I can I mean I mean I can absolutely say what I think are terrible picks like when you sign a quarterback to a mega guaranteed deal for the long term and then draft a second round quarterback in the top ten. Uh, I can be critical of that, but no. did the te- did the Chiefs take someone at a position and a player that you don't see a spot for? No, um, they didn't do that. I mean, you know, did w- were there any needs that they didn't hit? Running back is the one need, and you mentioned that maybe they sacrificed that because it, the one thing the Chiefs needed was a speed running back to me, and they probably, I mean, at, at w- that Wiley spot. Maybe even the speed was gone because at that point there weren't. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a terrible running back class as it was, kind of. Right. Like, I mean, then the sense that I mean, you know that because the best running back in this class was hurt. I mean, that tells you a lot. Next year's and running still, back, and he still got taken first. And he still got taken first. Um, next year's running back class is going to be a lot stronger. So maybe that was in the back of the Chiefs' mind was that you know what? There's going to be maybe a little bit more speed in the better field in next year's draft. So maybe we don't force it. Chiefs let this board come to them. I mean, that's yep. how you – if you end up with the number one safety in the fourth round, you you obviously let the board come to you and speak to you a little bit. They did that with Suamadia. I mean, you know, if the Chiefs felt like that was their guy and they wanted to, they could have they could have given up a lot more resources and gone up and gotten him earlier. You know, instead, they made the one small move with the 49ers just to make sure that nobody else traded with the 49ers to get him. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was it. I mean, they didn't make – Xavier Worthy. Got a first round grade on him. I mean, normally the Chiefs, you know, in the past, when a first round player like a Trent McDuffie falls down, they jump up even higher. Right. Um, but they had the patience. So I felt like that they managed the board well. They made moves when they felt it was appropriate. Um, did not sacrifice any picks. All they sacrificed was draft position. Um, that was really important to this organization to still come out with seven picks, and they were able to do that. And I mean, I don't think any one of these is a reach. I mean, even in the seventh round, I mean, you can almost take anybody. It's not going to be a reach. And yet, C.J. Hansen, quality player. Um, I I can't really quibble with any of these picks because they they meet a need, and I can make a case for all of them having either either competing for starting spots or absolutely winning a backup job. Yeah. So I'll say for me personally, just going looking at the remainder of the roster. Um, I'll just pull up my depth chart here. Yeah, the, the I would like to see them add another veteran running back. I know they have, <laughs> I know they have like seven on the roster, six of them that have played football before. Um, but yeah, I would like to see them add a, a, a speed. Because here's what's gonna happen over the. We'll see now that the draft's done. We'll see if any players get released or waived, and then if there's somebody that's there that I think can fit in from a speed perspective, they can. Hassan Hall had speed last year, and he was on my board, and the Chiefs brought him in, and he does have some speed to him. I would just like to see a veteran that's got a little bit more to it. And then selfishly, I'd like to see them add another interior veteran offensive lineman and maybe another veteran tackle just to be safe and get them now while they can and lock them in the roster for the camp months in case there is an injury. But, I mean, defensively, Unless some big surprise happens, I really don't think there's much to do. And then obviously, you know, we already talked about a veteran receiver like a Tyler Boyd or something. I'd love to see somebody like that come in and kind of just be insurance for Rasheed Rice. But I mean, overall, unless you're adding a running back, um, wide receiver, 
or additional O-line depth to kind of just be in there and compete during training camp. I think for the most part, the Chiefs roster is in really good position. Yeah, and... and that's hard you know, for me to say because you know how nitpicky I am. <laughs> We're both kind of nitpicky sometimes. I definitely get get charged with that sometimes. Um, and the Chiefs, you know, we're starting to see the undrafted free agents and some of the tryout players for next week's rookie mini camp trickle in. A um, couple of names that do stick out. You know, they did sign the UCLA running back Carson Steele to an undrafted free agent deal. Not agreed, the speed back. Agreed to terms, Matt. They won't sign agreed until next to terms. Weekend. Correct. Thank you for for correcting my language. Yes, agreed to terms since they won't they won't sign until they get into town. Um, not the speed back that either one of us was looking for. I mean, he ran a four seven five. So. Eh. Oh, Car- um, Carson? No, Carson's Carson's a fullback. <laughs> yeah, not a not a speed back, yeah. nothing like that. Uh, yeah. They also uh, agreed to terms with Amani Bailey from TCU. Not the fastest guy either. So, um, but there's not there's not speed out there. I mean, the undrafted free agents. Anybody with speed was drafted and drafted yeah. decently early. Um, the biggest name to me and the most fast anyone because I think it's like, it's an extra draft pick. It's Fabian Lovett, the defensive tackle from Florida State. I mean, we mm-hmm. talked about him. During our defensive tackle podcast, um, and I thought him. he, I thought he was going to be the seventh round pick, and I was going to do a really internal celebration about all right, seven for seven, and then they threw me the curveball. He's kind of an eighth round pick for me. I mean, that's that's a really really good get. I mean, and it should be a good situation for him. I think there's a spot for him to compete for a job for sure. Um, even though everybody coming back at tackle is there. Um, remember also, Chris Jones is the only defensive tackle. And Neil Farrell are the only two that the Chiefs have team control over for 2025. So um, there's a chance for a young guy. Um, and we'll see some more. We'll see if there's any others that sneak in. I mean, obviously, um, the the Chiefs will have a full complement for that rookie minicamp next week. A lot of tryout guys will be involved, along with the draft picks and the undrafted free agents. Um you know, I obviously, hey, they they will sign some special teams players, which they've done, or agree to terms, or invite to mini camp um, some special teams players, even though they have almost zero chance of making the team. Uh, I'll be interested to see if Matt Ariza is at the rookie mini camp because I believe he's technically eligible, but um, doesn't mean that he would would have to be there. So we'll 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 see. Uh, but and, and obviously, there's some injured players and some you know, second year players that are eligible. We'll see how, who are who who amongst them. Are out there with the rookies in the mini camp next weekend. Uh, but in summary, Nick, any any other bows that you want to put on this discussion about the draft? No, we've got a, a little bit over an hour now, so I think people are ready for uh for to move on with their day at this point. I, I, I appreciate if somebody you had to put it on 1.5 speed. So uh you are you're a brave individual, so I salute you. And with that, Nick, I guess I'll just leave it to you. Well, before I do that, I will say, please rate, review us, give us a share, share this on your Facebook, share it on your Twitter account, share it on your LinkedIn. Let more people know about 41 is the mic and the the work that you like that we do or that you hate that we do. Either way, just put our brand out there, please, Um, because Matt and I put a lot of work into this and we would uh, we just want to continue to provide as many cheese fans as we can as, as good of analysis and accurate perception as we as we personally can for this in this chief's global sphere or whatever you want to call it of uh information that's out there so that's uh that's all i can say but matt uh i'll give you one more chance anything else you want to add before i do it well i was just shamelessly trying to wrap it up so everybody you know can stop listening but obviously we'll be back on tuesday night for the Q and A for the Chiefs Digest Q and A, so please join us there on YouTube. If you got any questions and things we didn't cover, I mean Clark Hunt spoke this weekend. We'll talk about stadium if you want to do that. Katamba Hali is in the Ring of Honor. We can talk about that if you want to. Anything going on, especially had a rookie mini camp. You got some questions? Undrafted free agents coming in. We will talk about it Tuesday night. And as always, send your compliments to both of us, your positive words to both of us. Send your hate mail to me. I am vice president in charge of hate mail. So don't say bad things to Nick, especially, you know, how much of this he does on his free time. You send send hate mail to me. So Yeah, I don't think people have much of this I do on my free time. <laughs> I don't think they actually know. So, all right. So until next time, I bid you adieu.